All right. So dying kidney disease, you asked for the title. I don't know. I don't know. Stop protein poisoning. How would that be for the title? Save your kidneys, eat a very, very, very low protein diet. Preserve your kidneys. You need to keep them healthy because as I say, life on a dialysis machine is hell on earth. And most of you are sitting there listening to me with at least half of your kidney functioning. And you don't feel anything abnormal. You feel just fine. But, you know, it, it may not be that way forever. And some of you are there having compromised uh, kidney function. And I know you're going to be paying a lot of attention on how to keep the, the kidney you have remaining intact and maybe even reversing some of the disease. Now, this is the, the in, in, a, in a series that I've been giving about frank discussions that you ought to have with your doctor if you have kidney problems. You know, it's my, my strong belief that you should be offered diet therapy first because it cures the problems. And then if that doesn't solve your problems, you go on to the drugs and the devices and the machines, et cetera. But at least give cure a chance. You know, at least deal with the problems first. And how long do you, does it take to deal with the problems? You know, certainly 12. I wrote a book, uh, McDougall's Medicine, 12 Days to Dynamic Health. I haven't, I haven't changed that prescription. My challenge to you is, whether you have heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, or whatever, give me 12 days. You know, just 12 days. You could, you could go without food for 12 days and do okay. But I bet you have a whole different attitude about your health, your life, and the importance of food after you finish five to seven days, but for sure, 12 days. All right, the kidneys. The kidneys are located uh, uh, sort of in the back, about the size of your fist. And they describe them as uh, bead-shaped organs. You see them there, the kidneys, right below the liver, right below the spleen. Yeah, just below the rib cage, each side of the spine. And they filter about uh, a half a cup of blood every minute. And they, in this part process of filtering, this is, this is an excretory organ. It's a filtering organ. It removes waste from the body, you know, like environmental chemicals and protein waste, which is a huge part of its job. It reviews, or removes uh, drugs. Many of the drugs that you take are metabolized through the kidney. It balances your fluids so that you don't become a debitus or dehydrated. It uh, releases hormones. And you've heard of these hormones. They're... Uh, angiotensin uh, type hormones. There's angiotensin blockers and angiotensin receptor blockers and ACE inhibitors. They are related to the kidneys. They're just above the kidneys, the adrenal glands, mostly they're produced. But there are other hormones that, that are released from the kidneys that regulate blood pressure. And the, the final step to vitamin D metabolism, vitamin D metabolism, it starts in the skin with the... Uh, the action of sunlight on the skin, which converts plant sterols into precursor of vitamin D. And then it goes to the liver and it makes another conversion. And finally, it makes to the most active form of vitamin D, the final conversion in the kidneys. And it also produces hormones that uh, regulate your red blood cells. Big job. The disease is common when it comes to kidneys. Atherosclerosis, you know, the kidneys are full of blood vessels. Uh, cholesterol and fat and the lack of plant foods cause the blood vessels of the kidneys to become diseased. They get blocked. You have little heart attacks in the kidneys, and there's just a general deterioration of kidney mass. Uh, chemical poisons can, uh, can damage the kidneys. We're going to talk about kidney stones. We're going to talk about autoimmune disease. You can get infections in the kidneys, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in this lecture, too. Uh, most of those uh, infections in the kidneys have, and we'll talk about that. Excess dietary protein is the, uh, the most serious culprit when it comes to overworking and eventually damaging the kidneys over your lifetime. If uh, you have uh, shock, in other words, low blood pressure, really low because you're bleeding or you've had a heart attack and the heart doesn't function well and it doesn't deliver blood to the kidneys, you, you, you can develop permanent kidney damage. And, we're going to talk about kidney stones. One in seven Americans have chronic kidney disease. 
chronic kidney disease it means it's not going to get better with most efforts, except for changing your diet. Chronic means it's going to progress if you follow the standard American diet. More than 400,000 Americans have end-stage renal disease. In other words, they're facing a dialysis, a dialysis machine. And 300,000 of these patients require dialysis. You know, at this stage, most people go on to require in this machine. Uh, to assess kidney function, so you can't see the kidneys, they're located in the abdomen. So you can't visualize them directly unless you do a biopsy or in some way take some tissue out or you have a, an imaging technique, you do it that way. But it's generally done by blood tests. And most of you have had these blood tests done and you'll find them on a standard chemistry. There's a blood urea nitrogen. Urea is a product of breakdown of protein in the liver. So the protein you eat, the protein you take in terms of supplements, the protein that uh, is metabolized in your, in your body is turned in the liver into urea. And you can measure the amount of urea in the blood. Uh, normally the blood contains seven to 20 milligrams per deciliter of, of urea, urea. And try and remember that, that that's normal because I'm gonna to talk to you about, about urea and what you can do in terms of the McDougall diet as far as changing your BUN or your blood urea nitrogen. The other test that's done, and again, you'll find this on your laboratory test, is creatinine. Uh, creatinine comes from the muscles. Uh, it is a derived from a, another amino acid-like substance called creatine. And uh, the, the creatine is part of the muscles and the muscles break down into creatinine. And the normal levels, again, you want to you know, keep them in mind are 0.7 to 1.3 milligrams per deciliter. And then if you have uh, you know, further analysis on your blood test, they'll talk about a creatinine clearance. This doesn't have to be too complicated. You know, B1 and creatinine are your, what you're most concerned about. And then what doctors do is they take the amount of creatinine in, the, uh, in a certain volume of urine and the amount of creatinine in the blood, they do a little bit of mathematics and they make some divisions and they come up with something called creatinine clearance. Well, you know, creatinine clearance is how efficiently the kidneys clear creatinine from the body. Uh, this reflects something called the glomerular filter filtration rate, which is the glomeruli are the, the little units of filtration that are in the kidneys. And this reflects how those little glomeruli are working. That's the glomerular filtration rate. So really you have two things you got to think about when you're assessing your kidney function, that's BUN and creatinine. And if you want to do a little bit of fancy math, you want to do a calculation called creatinine clearance. So based on creatinine clearance or glomerular filtration rate, which is you know, probably a better way of looking at it, is in other words, <clears throat> how well the little kidney units are working in terms of filtering, uh, stage one is normal or good kidney function. And that means you can clear creatinine uh, at 90 milliliters per minute based on a certain body square measurement. Stage two, mild disease, uh, 60 to 89. You probably don't notice anything in stage two. Your B1 might be normal, your creatinine may be normal. When you get up to stage three with a creatinine clearance of about half of what it should be, then you start noticing the creatinine going up a little bit. It'll go, go up from say 1.2 to 1.4 or 1.5 or 1.6. Then you have stage three or moderate kidney disease. When it starts to get really, really concerning, we get down to a creatinine clearance of say 15 to 30. Then you see the creatinine, that blood test that we just talked about. We see the creatinine going up significantly. It'll be up around two, three, four, five. And we get to those kind of levels, four, five, six, as far as, uh, as the amount of creatinine in your blood, and, which represents a decrease in glomerular filtration rate that's very severe. Then you're in for a dialysis machine. All right, let's talk about the first and, and most common problem with the kidneys. It has an autoimmune disease. It's where the body attacks itself. And uh, these autoimmune diseases, they affect about 24 million Americans. 
And don't ask me why. I mean, people have asked me, and I'll tell you, I don't know why 80% of the people who get autoimmune diseases are women. Well, when the body attacks the kidneys, if it attacks the filtration part of the kidneys, we call that glomerular nephritis. If it's leaking a little bit of protein out in the urine called IgA1 or, or IgA, then we call it IgA nephropathy. Nephropathy represents a general term for kidney disease. We have lupus nephritis, good pasture syndrome. I've actually had a couple of situations where I've taken care of people with good pastures. This is where the body attacks, not just the kidneys, but attacks the lungs. And it's due to consumption of foods that introduce autoimmune disease, which are primarily animal products. And then we have a situation that's really mild, really benign, which is where you uh, see protein in the urine when you stand up called orthostatic albuminaria. Well, what happens is <clears throat> when you develop, and we'll go through the mechanisms here in a minute, when you develop uh, autoimmune diseases of the kidneys, the kidneys attack itself. The body makes antibodies that attack the kidneys. And you see a picture of what an antibody represents, and you see in the picture what a food protein represents. What happens is the body makes antibodies against foreign food proteins, which because of a confusion that occurs in the body, we call that molecular mimicry, the body attacks itself. Not just the, not just the food that's in the bloodstream, but also attacks itself. You've probably seen this, uh, this schematic before, I've shown it several times, but it's an explanation of how you get autoimmune diseases. You consume animal foods like pigs and cows. Uh, they go into the gastrointestinal tract. What happens is the gastrointestinal tract should be intact so that these food proteins don't enter into the bloodstream. But sometimes the gastrointestinal tract becomes leaky and food proteins go from the gut into the bloodstream. Why does the gut become leaky? Well, a couple of things happen. Just generally eating an unhealthy diet, you develop a condition where you have a whole bunch of unhealthy microbes. Your microbiome is diseased. You, you have bad bacteria in your gut, which damage the gut wall. This is called dysbiosis. And it leaves gaps in the wall and causes a leaky gut. The other situation where you have a leaky gut occur is when you have celiac disease, uh, which is due to wheat, barley, and rye, which is due to gluten. And you develop a leaky gut. So you get this leaky gut. What happens is the food, foreign food protein, you know, like, like kidney tissue from cows or pigs, gets through the gut wall into the bloodstream. And now the body makes antibodies to this foreign protein, like pig kidneys or cow kidneys, because these, these are foreign substances. These shouldn't be in the bloodstream. The body makes antibodies against these foreign proteins, but because the immune system is not that specific, it finds similar proteins on our own body tissues. Molecular mimicry, molecules, mimicry, copy. It finds copies of what it's looking for on our body tissues. And in this case, what we're talking to about is, uh, is, is kidneys. And you might stop and ask yourself, well, uh, how do you get foreign kidneys into your gut and into your bloodstream to cause the immune system to make antibodies against them? You ever been to a slaughterhouse? They waste nothing. So, you know, the kidneys, along with the spleens and the livers and the bones and the muscles and the skin and the scrotums and the vaginas and the lips and the tails, they get all ground up and we make what out of them? Sausages, hot dogs. And so, you're, you know, most Americans are constantly confronted with this assault of foreign proteins from the slaughterhouse, from the cows and pigs going through their gut wall into their bloodstream and the immune system has to deal with it all day long. And if they have a leaky gut or an immune system that's even less specific than it should be, then instead of just attack, attacking the cow and the pig kidneys in this case, they attack your own kidneys. Uh, this is a particularly important study that I want to show you. Uh, this, 
This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2011. This study audience, Chef AJ, should have changed the practice of medicine in terms of kidney diseases. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2011. The title of the study you see up the upper left hand corner, left -hand corner is Early Childhood Membranous Nephropathy. Remember, nephropathy means just general kidney disease due to catatonic bovine serum albumin. You know what bovine is, right? It's cow. Okay. So what happens is cow protein, and in this case, primarily milk protein, gets into the intestinal tract, through the gut wall, into the bloodstream. The body makes antibodies against this cow protein, which attack the glomeruli of the kidneys. Now, I showed this I showed this back in a book I published in 1985. You can see this one, one picture here in the center of the diagram. This is the picture I showed of what happens when you have autoimmune diseases. You have the body attacking proteins and making complexes that stick in the artery walls or it finds proteins in the walls of the tissues that the antibodies attack. So here you see the blood vessels uh, uh, being attacked by antibodies or forming complexes that stick in the arteries, which cause inflammation. I published this in 1985. If you see this picture here on the far right, the green deceleration, this is uh, what you see when you do immunofluorescence technology, where you, uh, you tag uh, antibodies to look for cow protein and you attack the tag, tag them with a fluorescent substance. And you can see the antibodies. This represents the green attacking these glomeruli. All right. So anyways, they did this wonderful study. They found, the, they found seven children. Uh, four of them had uh, well, biopsies like this that showed the, the, uh, the antibodies attacking the, the glomeruli. And in this study, what they did is they took the four children they found with circulating bovine serum albumin. They took them off the cow's milk and all four of them went through partial or complete remission. Now, this should, have, this should have formed the basic practice of pediatricians, of kidney doctors, to deal with the, the onslaught of patients that see that have these autoimmune diseases. This was largely ignored, this study, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this goes back, back many decades that we've known this. It's just that this particular study showed it with some of the, the most beautiful pictures, some of the most uh, sophisticated science, immunofluorescent technology. Anyway, that's what you see in here on the right. This is a glomeruli. The green represents the uh, the cow and the antibodies that are <clears throat> made by uh, made to cow protein, which are also attacking the, the cells of the glomeruli. All right, a whole bunch of autoimmune diseases, just to be general in my discussion. <laughs> what happens is you consume animal proteins. Uh, plant proteins won't do it. Why, why won't plant proteins do it? Well, even if they get from the gut into the bloodstream, because you're not a plant, it, it can't find similar proteins in your body tissues. It makes antibodies, if it does, and it doesn't, I imagine on occasion, to plant proteins, but because there's nothing similar in your body, your body doesn't get attacked. But because you're an animal, when it makes antibodies to various tissues in the body, it attacks similar tissues in your body. A whole list of them. Addison's disease, what happens is, is the antibodies attack the adrenal glands. Alopecia, you lose your hair, it attacks the hair follicles. There are a whole bunch of arthritis conditions, such as ankylosing spondylitis, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus, nonspecific arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. This is where the body attacks the joints. Uh, myasthenia gravis, this is where it attacks neuroemplates the end plates of the nerves. And psoriasis attacks the skin, the mental conditions such as schizophrenia, maybe autoimmune diseases. And when the bowel is attacked, we have ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And 
you, you attack the pigment cells of the skin, you get uh, vitiligo. You know, this is, it doesn't just go to a discussion of people who get sick enough to go to the doctor. And the way I look at things, because consuming these animal foods, these foreign proteins is so common. And because it is so common for the general public to suffer from aches and pains and fatigue, I believe that basically everybody is going through these autoimmune reactions from the food that they eat. They feel terrible. And it's, again, due to the food. Uh, Thomas Innes, uh, he's the father of kidney disease. In 1946, uh, he told us, he said, based upon personal clinical experience, that the reduction in renal workload by judicious dietary protein restriction was effective in minimizing further loss of kidneys in patients with chronic kidney insufficiency. This was 1946. What was that 70 years ago? You know, Anyway, what he went on further and said, he said, if, if you reduce the protein in the diet, then it'll reduce the progression of kidney disease and death by 33 to 50%. The basic science all says this, but what you need to understand if you go and explore the research is the spin doctors hired by the food industry, the drug industry, et cetera have taken this basic undeniable research that protein is toxic to the kidneys and they've spun it into a message where, you know, most patients and most doctors think this is untrue. It went on and discovered as many, many hundreds of researchers have, that if you restrict the protein in the diet, you either stop or you slow down the progression of kidney disease. You know, people who have kidney disease, they naturally don't like to eat animal products. This is one of the things that's been discovered even when I was a young doctor is patients with severe kidney failure, those who are either ready to go on dialysis or on dialysis have a, a natural aversion to eating meat and fish. The body's pretty smart. All right. That is relevant to people who you know, already have kidney problems. But I want to talk about you and I for just a minute. Through the, the normal wear and tear that occurs due, due to eating a high protein diet and other things that damage the kidneys, what happens is as you progress through life up until you get into, say, your well, seventh decade or eighth decade of life, which is where I'm at, the average American has lost a third to a half of their kidney function. Just, just from normal eating and normal living a third to a half of the kidney function is gone, primarily due to the high protein diet, but secondarily due to diabetes and atherosclerosis and so on. But you don't notice it. And the reason you don't notice it is because the kidneys are so forgiving that you only need 25% of your kidney function to clear all the waste from the body. Still, until you've lost 75% of your kidneys, your creatinine doesn't even start to go up. Your BUN doesn't even go up. You've got to lose three quarters of the kidney mass. So anyways, when somebody comes to me with an elevated creatinine, BUN, not so important, but an elevated creatinine is, I already know they're in trouble. I already know they've lost, you know, probably 75% of their kidneys. And, and the time interval, the amount of destruction that needs to be done to take you from 25% of kidney function to none is not long. You've only got a little bit of kidney mass left. Anyway, uh, this is something that happens to, to everybody is they're losing their kidneys. Where it becomes really relevant is when you've already lost some of your kidney mass, like uh, AJ, you said you had a, a friend who donated a kidney. You were telling me just before we started that, that that person has lost half their kidney mass. And in that case, what happens is this becomes very relevant because you, you increase the flows and pressures when you're dealing with half the mass as opposed to the whole mass. You increase the flows and pressures greatly and you hurry up these people onto a dialysis machine. 
All right, a guy named uh, Brenner uh, published a classic article in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1982. Again, these are the articles that, I, that I've lived with my whole medical career, and the articles that should have changed the way medicine's practiced. Uh, Brenner, what he did is he uh, looked at kidney function, and he came to the conclusion also that a high-protein diet resulted in an excess workload. The work is done primarily by this unit of the kidney. It's called the glomeruli. And when you when you eat a high protein diet, what happens is the, the protein causes the flows and pressures in the tubules of the, of the kidney to increase greatly and uh, it accelerates the damage. You develop something that's called renal hypertension. Okay, you get high blood pressure in the kidney tubules. And through sustained elevated pressure caused by all this excess work to get rid of the protein, through sustained elevated pressures, you end up destroying a whole bunch of kidney. Now, you know, there's a quote here that uh, reflects how I started this presentation and how I'm gonna end the presentation on chronic kidney disease. And that's a statement that Brenner made in his article in 1982. What he said is he said, with the development and increasing widespread availability of dialysis and transplantation in the past three decades, this was 1982, relative little attention has been paid to the influence on diet on the progression of kidney disease. You know, here we are, you know, 40 plus years later, and he knew this in 1982, that because of these high tech machines, not only has diet been ignored, professionals have actively campaigned against you knowing anything about how you can preserve your kidneys or even reverse some of the kidney disease. Of course, you probably know all this, don't you? Because you've listened to my lectures on heart disease and you realize that after the discussion, me showing you all the literature that heart surgery does not save lives. Well, why is that all you hear about? You don't hear anything about diet in terms of prevention or treating heart disease. Why? Because you've got this multi-billion dollar a year business out there called bypass surgery or, or angioplasty. You know, why don't you hear about the dietary implications of uh, cancer? Well, because you have a multi-billion dollar business out there that deal drugs and surgeries when you have cancer. And why don't you hear more about the effect of diet on kidney function, because you've got the dialysis business out there. All right, when we talk about high protein, we're talking about typical things that people eat, uh, like the animal foods, they're even vegetable foods, uh, beans, peas, lentils, nuts, seeds, avocados, they're high protein. In fact, the first book I wrote called The McDougal Plan, I put little symbols on the recipes, uh, like in the case of protein, I put a little pea pod, case of uh, salt, I put a salt shaker. In case of sugars, I put a honeybee. You know, uh, I, I did uh, put a little symbols by the recipe so that it would alert you as to whether or not you had to be a little extra cautious when it came to choosing these kinds of recipes. Well, back then, you know, back in the early 80s, when I published the McDougal plan, when I was developing all of this, my intention was to take care of really sick people. You know, people who are, you know, facing the dialysis machine or the or the heart surgery business. You know, I wasn't concerned about taking care of the general population. And that's why I went to such extremes as far as identifying all of these foods that could be detrimental to your health. But what I discovered in the last 47 years is that almost everybody's sick. I mean, just consider 80% of people in this country are obese or overweight. You add in their diabetes and high blood pressure and autoimmune diseases. Uh, you are basically talking about the fact that essentially nobody, unless they know the things that we know and follow it, essentially nobody is healthy. Anyway, you need to be careful about the foods, the high protein foods, supplements uh, like uh, isolated soy protein supplements, whey powder supplements, uh, isolated uh, soy protein foods, you know, like fake burgers and fake hot dogs. These things are very high in protein. Your, your fake hot dogs are 70% isolated soy protein. You need to stay away from this stuff. 
All right, talk about the dialysis. <laughs> There's an article uh, in the New York Times. It was uh, published recently in the last couple of months. But the reference is there, you can read it. It's about the obscene nature of the dialysis industry. They point out that this is a, a $33 billion a year business. You know, they have profit margins that are huge. If people have to go to the dialysis ward, they spend four hours a session, three sessions a week, attached to this machine that sucks their blood out, filters the blood, and puts the filtered blood back into the body. Not a perfect machine. And it controls your, your, your proteins and, and some of your electrolytes and so on, but doesn't remove cholesterol, doesn't remove fat, doesn't remove environmental toxins. Anyway, costs $90,000 a year to take care of one dialysis patient. A low protein, a healthy diet will keep people away from the dialysis machine and they need to know that. Maybe not permanently, for a long period of time. And as I mentioned to you, twice at least, the dialysis ward is hell on earth. You, I, I used to tell my patients, if, if you have any hesitation, reservation about eating a healthy diet, you come to the local hospital. You know, in that case, I, I, I had privileges at the local hospital. And I'll take you through the dialysis board and I'll show you what your life is going to be like. Well, that was one way to convince them. They didn't want to spend their, their few days left there. And I mean few, because when you're that sick with very severe chronic kidney disease, and especially when you're on dialysis, you have a very high rate of dying, you know, particularly of atherosclerosis. Which, by the way, is mitigated if you follow a healthy diet on dialysis. The problem is, I have to emphasize, is you're not going to get any cooperation. You know, the, the renal doctors are not trained in diet therapy. Neither are the renal dietitians. By, uh, by obligation, when you go to see the kidney specialist and their dietitians, they have to tell you that a low protein diet is important. Maybe these days they don't. The brainwashing has gone on so severely that it's possible that these days doctors don't even feel that kind of obligation to mention a low protein diet and how essential it is when you're a kidney patient. And then you go see the dietitian, the dietitian says the same thing, you need to be on a low protein diet. And then both of them get together or separately and they say, well, let me show you the dialysis ward. You can eat anything you want, we'll just suck it off. Not true. $34 billion a year business. Let me show you the uh, a real alternative to, to the dialysis ward in people with severe kidney disease. And that has to, that comes from the Kempner diet, which I've talked to you a lot about. Uh, Kempner is well known for weight loss, diabetes, high blood pressure, and also for kidney disease. Here's one of his kidney patients. It's kind of interesting, Walter Kempner didn't write much in terms of records, but he took lots of pictures. And here's a picture that he took of a young girl uh, suffering from nephronic syndrome, severe kidney failure due to glomerular nephritis, which is the condition we just talked about. The condition that's caused by, at least in some cases, could be caused by viruses or other food proteins, but is caused by, in the case of the 2011, New England Journal of Medicine article in those four children was caused by cow protein, which came from milk. And so this poor little girl, she's suffering terribly. And uh, <clears throat> over the uh, well, next few months, she goes on the Kempner diet and is basically cured. Now, the Kempner diet, I want to go over that with you uh, just for a minute. Most of you are familiar with it. Kempner diet is very low protein, very high carbohydrate, very low fat. Kempner diet is made of white rice, could be brown, you know, brown will work just as well, fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar. You know, in people who are underweight, he would sometimes add 2,000 calories of white sugar to the diet of the patients so that they wouldn't lose more weight. And those who are underweight, 
2,000 calories of white sugar. And what happens? These people, well, they would thrive. Why? Because you remove the poisons, primarily the protein in this case, but the fat's important too. And you provide the body with energy, calories, in the form of simple sugar. And even though this is a lot of simple sugar, uh, a lot of lack of real food, these people were in very good health. You want to you read about it? You want to read about the metabolic ward studies that were done on the Kempner diet where you know, his uh, condescending colleagues decided they were going to prove Walter Kempner wrong and took uh, eight of his patients and put them in a metabolic ward and studied them? My December 2013 newsletter will direct you to that study and more work by Walter Kempner, December of 2013. Anyway, this is the extreme as far as taking care of somebody who has failing kidneys. But faced with the fact that you're going to be tied to a dialysis machine, don't you think it would be worth it to delay that experience or maybe avoid it altogether? Like in this case, or in the case of the four little kids that were published in the 2011 New England Journal of Medicine article. I think so. Well, I think at least you and your parents, your relatives should be given a choice. You want to spend $90,000 a year? You don't pay for it, I know. Government does, or the insurance company does. You want to spend three days a week, four hours each time, sitting in a dialysis ward on, on a bed along with a whole bunch of other people, attached to a machine, I think you should be given the choice. And so uh, I would say probably once a program, our 12-day internet program, we have somebody that has that severe kidney disease where they're about to go on dialysis. We don't encourage people who are already on dialysis to join us unless they really want to. And I've helped a few people who have really wanted to. Why? Because they and I have to deal with the, the renal doctors and the the renal dietitians and plain and simple, it often doesn't work out well because they're not sympathetic to our cause, which is keeping you away from technology and healthy as long as possible. All right, let me show you the results uh, of changing our basic diet, which is starch, vegetables, and fruits. Not, not like the Kempner diet. You know, this is an acceptable diet. I, 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 I refer to the Kempner diet as the diet for the nearly dead. You know, I, I consider the McDougall diet for the living. There's no apology here. This is the tastiest food, the most varied food, the most enjoyable food, the least expensive food, the least toxic food that you can eat. And here's a study of, uh, of 1,700 of our patients. One, excuse me, 1,615 of our patients published uh, in 2014. Never been criticized. There's no reason to criticize our results. This is a look at people over the seven days they spent with us at the residential program. 1,615 people. And this is what we found. Look at the results here. The blood urea nitrogens in seven days in people who had elevated BUN levels. They dropped 10 points. They were cut in half in seven days. Now, creatinine is much more stable. They, and and uh, we're dealing with much smaller values here, but it did drop a tenth of a point. It improved. And all you want is you just want it to not get any worse. Now, this decrease in blood urea nitrogen of 10 points, cutting the BUN in half, it represents eating less protein and better function of the kidneys. In addition to the change in diet that I help people with, is I get them off of most of their drugs. Because these drugs, especially the blood pressure medications, decrease the flows, the flow of blood to the kidneys. It cause the BUN to go up. And so we get improvement in their BUN levels, blood urea nitrogen, 10 points, seven days, by two things. One, getting the protein down in the diet, not extreme, but down, and by getting them off unnecessary medications and improving the flow of blood to the kidneys. And this will translate in time into preserved or at least a slower progression of kidney disease. Why not? 
doesn't cost anything, no side effects. All right, so there are certain extra, extra efforts I have to make when somebody has severe kidney disease. We're talking about somebody with a glomerular filtration rate of over 20 milliliters per minute. They're, they're, they are running creatinines of uh, three, four, five, six. People who are really ill, they're not quite on the dialysis uh, machine yet. As I told you, that's, that's a, a very difficult situation. But I feed them a diet based on starches. The kind of starches I feed them are grains primarily, you know, like corn and rice and wheat. Feed them grains. The reason I feed them grains is because grains are low in potassium relative to root vegetables like potatoes and sweet potatoes. So if you're going, if you get to that level of kidney failure, you should focus on grains as your primary starch. Now, not, not only ourselves, but also the scientific literature has published uh, the benefits of the pretty much the exact same diet I'm telling you about. Uh, you have to stay away from animal foods. Uh, that means dairy and poultry and fish and beef and chicken and so on. They all have to be out of your diet. Why too high in protein? Just, I just shared with you how protein puts wear and tear on the kidneys. Even healthy people. All right, you, know, you need to know all proteins aren't the same. Uh, vegetable proteins are much better tolerated by the kidney than our animal proteins. Uh, so when you're, you know, when you, if when you pick protein sources, you just want to pick the starches, vegetables, and fruits. But I still think you ought to be careful about high protein starches, like for example your legumes. And I recommend that somebody with this severe kidney disease, they avoid beans, peas, lentils. That, that's what I published in the book, McDougall Plan back almost 40 years ago. And put those little symbols up there to tell you on the recipes. Is I recommended that in general, if you're on a healthy diet you, and you are healthy, you're not in kidney failure, that you limit your beans, peas, and lentils to a cup of cooked every other day. Now you say, that doesn't sound like a lot, but think about it. You know, a cup, cup and a half of beans, peas, and lentils every other day. There's some, oh, excuse me, every, uh, half a cup every day. That's what it is, half a cup every day. Uh, but if you eat a half a cup or a cup every day, there are many days when you don't have bean, pea, and lentil dishes. So you can eat a little bit more on the day, on the odd days. Anyway, in general, you ought to be careful about beans, peas, and lentils because they're about 30% protein. Uh, you got to be careful of potassium. Potassium's in fruits and vegetables and your underground storage organs, such as your potatoes and sweet potatoes. So when you start getting down to around 25% of kidney function being left, and that's when your creatinine just starts to go up a little bit. You know, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. When you get down to that level, you got to start paying attention to your, your potassium. You need to check your potassium on occasion. When you get down to the point where you've lost 90 to 95% of your kidneys, you only have, say, 5, 7, or 10% left, then you can get into really big trouble by eating high potassium foods. But e even that said, when they treated kidney patients, stage three kidney disease, three, you know, they, they're starting to get an elevated creatinine level. With the DASH diet, they saw no problems with potassium levels. This is a big study done. And they fed them on all, I mean, their diet is based upon high potassium fruits and vegetables. The other concern that people have about for kidney patients, I know I'm getting a little greater detail than you probably need to hear about, but uh, there's some people out here listening who need to have this kind of detail. The other thing is that plants contain a lot of phosphorus and, and phosphorus builds up in a kidney patient. Well, what you need to know is that phosphorus is not efficiently absorbed from plants. It is from animal foods, but not from plants. And so phosphorus does not become a problem. So what you're gonna hear when you are faced with 
you know, more serious treatment of kidney disease, your pre-dialysis or your dialysis, uh, you know, you're getting your, 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 your blood shunts in, you know, so that they can take blood out of you. They, they, they put a, they put a, a, a connection where you can easily uh, tap into the vein. When, when you get to that point, you're going to start hearing about protein, potassium, and phosphorus. And I just want you to be aware that plant foods, until you get really, really, really sick, uh, don't provide a problem when it comes to the three areas. All right, uh, nuts and seeds. Well, nuts and seeds are high fat, but they're also high protein. And uh, they're low carbohydrate. And what we want to have is we want to have a lot of, a lot of sugar, like the calorie. Remember, you know, carbohydrate is, what I'm talking about is basically starches. So uh, the nuts, seeds, and autos are high in fat, and the nuts and seeds have too much protein, as far as I'm concerned, for you to include many of them on a, on a diet when you have kidney failure. But the one thing nice that you get to do is you get to add extra sugar to your food. Why? Sugar has no protein, no potassium, no phosphorus, it, just like with the Kepler diet, which is 94% sugar in the form of rice, white rice and table sugar. You get to consume extra sugar in a diet for kidney patients. All right. The other thing you have to deal with is you have to deal with the vitamin D because the kidneys make the most potent form of vitamin D. It's the final stage of metabolism of D to make it into the most active form, which is 125 dihydroxy, dihydroxy vitamin D. Almost all kidney patients get vitamin D supplements, either in terms of shots or pills. But what you need to understand is that the research done on giving these supplements shows no reduction in fractures. Just, just like for the general population, I've been over this with you in terms of my nutrient lecture. In the general population, vitamin D supplements are basically useless and harmful. If, if you take more than a thousand international units a day, you get into problems. More than 2,000 international units a day, you have an increase of falls and fractures. But the most important thing is you don't reduce your falls and fractures, even when you have kidney disease. So what do you do? You make sure you get enough sunshine. And if you are in a situation where you decide that you're going to take vitamin D, a good dose would be 400 international units. Certainly not 2,000 and probably not 1,000 international units daily. All right, let's go on to another subject. Just about done. Let's talk about kidney stones. 12% of our population has kidney stones. Most stones are calcium oxalate stones. In other words, after you pass a stone, the doctor says, bring it into the lab, I'll analyze it, and we'll find out what it's made of so we can tell you what to do. And what you find is that somewhere around 85, 90% of stones when they analyze, it will be made of a mineral compound called calcium oxalate. And what the doctor will tell you is don't eat green and yellow vegetables because they're high in oxalates. A few of the stones are based on uric acid. Uric acid has to do with protein metabolism, has to do uh, with another condition called gout. And again, it all comes back to eating too much animal food you get uric acid and you form uric acid stones. But I want to talk to you about the calcium oxalate stones because that's, that's the one almost all of you'll run into. Is, uh, there are certain circumstances where we've just, we found out that the kidney stones are due to our diet. One thing we observed is people who live in populations that eat a rich diet, like in Europe, the United States, Australia, these people have a high incidence of stones. After World War II, the incidence of stones in, in Europe went up tremendously as epidemic as food returned to the populations of Europe. Uh, people living in Africa or Asia or India, you know, at one time they lived on a starch-based diet, a high carbohydrate diet, low in protein. They have very few stones. So what happens when you have a kidney stone? Well, you suffer terribly. They tell me that it is worse than having a baby to have a kidney stone, the pain is. What you end up doing is you end up going to the hospital. Uh, in the hospital, they'll give you narcotics to help you with the pain and wait for you to pass it. 
and you will pass it most of the time on your own. It's a very bloody painful experience. The doctor will uh, take a catheter, go up your ureter and crush the stone and or grab the stone and pull it out. Or they have also uh, extracorporeal, in other words, outside the body, shockwave, lithotripsy. They break up the stones by these sound waves to the, that particular area. And they'll break them up and they'll, they'll, they'll end up more easily getting out of your ureter and your kidneys. All right. So you're told not to eat vegetables because they're high in oxalates. All right. There uh, was an article published, uh, this was published in the British Journal of Urology in 1979. The title of the article is, Should Recurrent Calcium Oxalate Stone Formers Become Vegetarians? 1979. They realized that vegetarians, the vegetarian diet, you're very unlikely to get these calcium oxalate stones, but vegetarian diets, they eat a lot of high oxalate foods because there are oxalates in vegetables. Well, how did this play out? You know, how, how does this occur? Well, all right. The, uh, on, on a, let's, let's take a look at this graph here on the right. You see uh, the calcium excretion into the urine is very high on animal protein. You see that? Uh, when you eat a high, high animal protein diet, the oxalate excretion is also great in the urine. You've got to have the calcium and the oxalate in the urine to, to combine to form these calcium oxalate stones. Also, uric acid is high in the urine because of animal foods. I told you that's the second kind of storm. So how in the world does animal protein result in high oxalates or high calcium? I mean, meat is essentially deficient in both of those substances. It has no, uh, no oxalate, almost no oxalate, and it's very little calcium meatless. Well, let's talk about how it occurs. The way you get the calcium into the urine to form the stone is by eating a high protein, protein diet. What happens is the high animal protein diet because it brings acid into the system, causes the bones to dissolve, and as a result, you get high levels of calcium in the urine. You get hypercalcuria from the protein that causes the bones to dissolve because of the protein's acidic nature. So that's how you get the calcium. Well, how do you get the oxalate? Well, let me explain to you how you get the oxalate. The oxalates are in green and yellow vegetables. They're in a non-absorbable form. In other words, when you eat the chard or the celery or the turnips or the carrots, it all stays intact as calcium oxalate in your gut. It's not absorbed, but through a process known as, uh, as saponification, here it is, saponification, uh, calcium, the calcium oxalate that's in the chard or the other vegetables is saponified by fat. Fat soap, okay. Fat causes the action that you see with like bar soap. The fat grabs a hold of the calcium in the gut and frees up the oxalate. And that's how you get high, high levels of oxalate from your food, is that it first has to be freed up by eating a high fat diet. And then you have the two components your kidney system, the calcium and the oxalate, grow together to form the calcium oxalate stones. All right. Last, last discussion here, and it has to do with bladder infections. Bladder infections can lead to kidney infections, so you don't want to let one go. Um, bladder infections are common, particularly in women. In fact, if you have a bladder infection as a man, that's an indication to see a urologist because there's something pretty serious wrong. But women, because they have such a short a short urethra, the connection between the bladder and the outside world. They have such a short urethra, they have an increased risk of having bacteria pushed from the outside world into the bladder. And this happens frequently during sexual relations. And that's why we call it honeymoon cystitis. You know, women commonly recognize, or women commonly have bladder infections after they have a sexual intercourse. 
So what do you do? Well, you know, some women decide that they're not going to avoid sexual intercourse. They could also have better communication with their partner and uh, their partner, or they should come to the understanding that you can't traumatize this poor little urethra. Just doesn't work out well. Push bacteria up into the bladder. The other thing that's recommended is to urinate after sexual intercourse. And the two other things that are done, if you have the, the signs of a bladder infection starting, you've got burning in your urine, maybe you even see blood in your urine. Two other things you could do, and some women do this right after intercourse because they have such a frequent cystitis. And they would be things like cranberry juice or blackberry juice, which has been proven scientifically to prevent the adherence of bacteria to the bladder wall and to not only prevent, but to cure bladder infections. Now, you may hear this is very controversial. Again, it's the spin doctors from the side industry that want you to not put any attention into such natural, simple remedies. But the research is there. You can juice. You need to drink a whole quart of it at one time. Cranberry juice supplement or blackberry juice pill. But the other thing that uh, uh, that people do, and again, we're talking particularly about women, is they can take antibiotics. And some of them take antibiotics right after intercourse. Uh, and that's one thing that they could do. But I just want to give a, a general recommendation for, for treating blood. You can recommend, and I have treated for the last, my patients for the last probably 40 years with single dose antibacterial therapy, antibiotic therapy, single dose. You, your doctor gives you, she gives you pills, Ceptra, Ampicillin, uh, other types of antibiotics. They kill bacteria in the bladder. And you're told you need to take the pills four times a day for 10 days. Well, what does that do? That sells an awful lot of pills, doesn't it? But does it result in a better cure rate than taking a single dose of antibiotic? No, it doesn't. That single dose needs to be double the usual dose. And the way I've been treating my patients, you know, all, during all this time, very successfully, and again, the scientific research shows this is the way to do it, is if you came to me complaining of burning in your, on your urination or blood in your urine, a urinalysis and maybe some bacterial cultures, I would prescribe for you of three grams of septa, you know, nation drug. I give you one double dose and you get a rate as good as if you took it for 10 days. All right. So that's hopefully everything about kidney disease. Uh, in summary, you need a healthy diet. Uh, McDougal, the diet you need to follow. You know, size, restrain, just how to feed these and nuts and seeds too, because they're high protein to be high in fat. But the good thing is, and you, you love this part of this message, the good thing is, is you get to eat more sugar. Sugar, when I say sugar, you know, those of you who have followed me for a long time know that I mean starches and fruits, but even, even simple sugars. There's a, a place because you're adding calories without protein, you're cutting down the amount of wear and tear on the kidneys. And, and in those special circumstances where you have to limit phosphorus and potassium, you're adding calories without phosphorus and potassium. Remember, Walter Kempner treated his kidney patients with a diet that was 94% sugar, white rice, fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar.